Lord God, thank you for giving us this opportunity to study your word tonight. Bless us through it that we grow in our appreciation for the gifts that you give us and uh, the love that you show us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Any questions? I know, Kat, you've got some um, that I'll get to when we go to finish lesson eight. Uh, but any questions other than that? Uh, and then because um, we'll do lesson five right now. Uh, and then we should have some time left at the end, and we'll we'll pick up where we were at eight and get to get to your questions there and see how how long that takes us. So um, we're ready to jump into five. In uh, in lesson three, we talked about you know God's plan of salvation right through Jesus. Um, in lesson four, we talked about how the Holy Spirit gives us faith and then strengthens that faith and uses the Word. Um, in lesson seven, we talked about the sacraments, another tool that the Spirit uses to to give and strengthen faith. And, and here in chapter, chapter five, uh, we're going to talk about one of the blessings that he gives to believers, and that is a fellowship of believers, that the encouragement of other believers. Uh, we talk about the holy Christian church. So, so the, the word church um, is a word that gets used in, in a lot of ways. Uh, so maybe just to, to start it off, um, Give me some some ways that that word church is is used. Like, what does church mean, or what can church mean? Like the building. Okay, yeah, this is Abiding Grace Lutheran Church, right? It's it's the the building. So you talk about you go into the church. Um, other things. Before we had a building, we were still Abiding Grace Lutheran Church when we were worshiping in a you know middle school cafeteria like a gathering or fellowship okay. yeah so the, the the group of people that that uh, um, are part of this organization um, and I suppose well, you said the gathering so you know uh, we went to church on Sunday morning even though it wasn't a church building but that thing that you do on Sunday morning worship some people use the word church for that um, it can be used in a lot of ways I guess is my point when the Bible uses the term church, uh, it really uses it in two ways, and both are really two sides of the same coin. So um, it we'll, we'll talk about the, the church. Sometimes we talk about a capital C church and a lowercase c church. So, so the Holy Christian Church, the, the church from God's point of view, um, which is all believers. Uh, and, and, you know, of course, it's from God's point of view because only God can see the heart. Only God knows who is a believer. Uh, and then the lowercase c church is the... Uh, um, the church from our vantage point, you know, the people that have gathered together and say, hey, I'm a part of this church, right? Those who have um, you know, made their membership promises or those who are gathering and, and calling themselves a part of the, the church. And so we'll look at both of those um, as we go through the lesson. But first, we'll start with that, that capital C, the Holy Christian Church. Um, and so you've got on, on page 25 there, what is the Holy Christian Church? Well, it's the body of all believers called Holy because its members are pure and holy. Victor, you want Colossians 1.22? But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight. Yeah, through what Jesus has done, through our relationship to him, we are holy. So it's the holy Christian church. It's Christian because, well, it's all about Christ, the, the cornerstone. Uh, Haley, you want uh, 1 Corinthians 1.23? We preach Christ crucified. Yeah, you know, Paul said, "This is what we're all about. This is what, this is what we we preach and teach." Um, and then it's the body of all believers called church, because its members have been called out of the darkness of unbelief. the The, the Greek word for church is ekklesia. So ek, like in exit out of, and then klesia is a calling. So real literally, the church is a calling out. Um, and so as I read this passage, um, I want you to, to notice how it talks about us being called out of darkness into the light, called out of unbelief into faith. You know, we've been church, we've been, we've been made a part of this body of believers. Uh, and, and in this kind of longer section, he uses a few different pictures to describe the, the church. Um, so, uh, 1 Peter 1. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. 
So he says, you know, you, you, you come to faith, right? You, you're listening to the truth, and that has made you pure, right? You're holy through faith, like uh, um, uh, Paul has said in Colossians. He says, so since that's true, love each other deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, something that wears out, but of imperishable, something that doesn't wear out, through the living and enduring word of God. So, you know, God's word doesn't change. It doesn't wear out. Um, we're, we're into something eternal with this, right? Uh, so he says, you've been born again, uh, not of imperishable, but of perishable through the living and enduring word of God. And then he quotes that word. He says, for all men are like grass and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Hey, Chip, how's it going? Hey, how's everybody doing? Doing well, doing well. well. We're on page 25 in Lesson 5, and we're reading 1 Peter 1, um, and I'm just getting into 1 Peter 2 here. So he's he's talking about the church, uh, you know, the body of all believers, um, and, and, and we talked about how that, that word church, the Greek word is ekklesia, it's a calling out, um, and, and so uh, Peter's now describing what that looks like. So he says, we've been born again through the word of God, uh, and then in chapter 2, he says, therefore... Rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. So, you know, since since you've been made holy, since you're part of this, it doesn't make sense to be living in those things. And then in verse 2, he says, like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you've tasted that the Lord is good. Um, you know, he had just said that it was God's word that made us what we are. Um, and now he says, like, like newborn babies, crave that that spiritual milk i mean think about the picture of that um if if you give a baby a bottle you know and, and the, the baby starts drinking the milk and but as soon as as soon as the baby starts getting something you, you pull that bottle away what does the baby do it's gonna cry yeah it's gonna cry right it's gonna scream it's gonna you know give me that back uh even though it doesn't have any words you know exactly what it's saying right um why Babies don't know how to express themselves uh, other than by crying. Okay. And it's hungry. It's hungry. Okay. Yeah. So it, it it realizes that that this thing is filling the need, right? Um. Probably likes the taste of it, right? Deep down, it knows it needs it, right? And he says, he says that's how we should be about God's word. Um. You know, if, if someone's trying to get between me and my time in God's word, I I shouldn't let that happen, right? Like that baby. Uh, does everything it can to, to change that situation. Um, we should treat God's word like that. We should crave it like the baby craves the milk um, so that by it you grow up in your salvation, right? We know we need it for our strength. And he says, now that you've tasted that the Lord is good. So, you know, we've seen God's word. We've heard God's word. We know what it's about. Um, realizing that, we should want it, right? And then he goes on. He starts another picture. He says, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So he, he now uses the picture of this, this cornerstone and the stones built on him. And of course, Jesus is that cornerstone. And, and this was something that was prophesied in the Old Testament, the, the cornerstone that the church would be built on. Um, and notice how it said that that stone was rejected by men. Jesus came and, and people said, no, he's not the one. Let's kill him, right? Um, but even though men rejected him, that was the right one, right? Chosen by God, precious to him. And then he, he quotes in, in verse 6, for in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now, to you who believe this stone is precious, right? We realize how important Jesus is and how important hearing about Jesus is. But to those who do not believe, now he quotes Isaiah again, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Um, you know, the, uh, the one that they rejected, the most important one, a capstone in an arch, you know what the capstone is? It's that, that center stone. Um, back in, in the old days, before all the, 
modern steel and, and pouring stuff, uh, you know, you're just stacking up stones to, to make an arch. Um, that, that capstone was essential. You know, it's just the pressure of all the stones that holds that in place. What happens if you remove the capstone? The whole thing crumbles, right? Um, so he says, uh, uh, to you believe the stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become a capstone. And a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. You know, they, they looked at Jesus and they said, no way, that's not the one. And they ended up going off and, and killing him and, and, and going the wrong direction. And then Paul, then uh, Peter writes, they stumble because they disobey the message, right? They don't listen to God's word, which is also what they were destined for. You know, if, if you're not going to listen to God's word, of course, you're going to stumble. But then he says, but you, that's not you, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. And that's a pretty powerful uh, descriptor there, because for the Old Testament people of Israel, kind of the two most important offices were the king and the high priest. Um, and the high priests all had to be descendants of Aaron, and the kings all had to be descendants of, you know, from the tribe of, of uh, descendants of David. Uh, and, and you couldn't be, you couldn't be both. Um, but in, of course, Jesus came, and he was the perfect king, and he was the perfect priest. And now he says, that's what we are. Uh, by faith, he's made us a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So that called out, there's that ecclesia, that's the Greek word for church. Um, and notice the purpose, that you may declare the praises. So he made us a part of this church so that we can give glory to God, right? Uh, he brought us out of darkness into his light. He said, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war I the glory. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Um, so, kind of a longer section there, but it's all about what it means to be the church, right? Called out um, of unbelief, called out of darkness, called into the light, called into faith, called into, into God's family um, to, to be giving glory to God. Uh, and you see the notes there, you know, the definite of church means those who have been called out by God. Um, what does God urge us to do in, in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 2? Well, he said, crave that pure spiritual milk, right? So desire that. Uh, the church is described as a building with Jesus as the cornerstone. And then in 2.9, we see our status of God's children and our purpose in life, right? To declare the praises of God. Uh, any questions on the holy Christian church? So the, the gathering of all believers of all time. Of course, only God can see who... A, a real believer is and, and who's pretending and lying. Um, but uh, he knows his, and, and you know, so you have the church uh, extending throughout time. Any questions there on the Holy Christian Church? Okay. Then we go to the second part and talk about a Christian congregation. So the, the lowercase c church. Um, you know, we talk about how the, the Bible sometimes refers to the church as this gathering of believers, and sometimes it talks about a localized church, like the, the church that gathers at Lydia's house, or the church in Ephesus, or the church in Smyrna. Um, you, you see these things mentioned, uh, the church in Jerusalem. It was that gathering of believers at that place, and you know, you can see who's there, right? So, so, so we know who's a part of, of that, um, and, and the Bible describes that in several ways. So first of all, it's a group of people devoted to four things. Um, probably the, the most description we have of any of the local congregations would have been of the, the early Christian church in Jerusalem. Um, and in Acts 2, we hear what they were all about. Now, there's a lot of things that a church can do. And so, you know, this church was feeding the poor and, and helping the widows and all of that. Um, but where that all comes from is important um, because there's a difference between a church and a, a social club or a, a benevolence club, um, and, and this is what this is what uh, uh, Luke gets into here in Acts two. So let's see, Kat, you want to read that? Sure. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And they did a lot of things, but they devoted themselves to these things. So, so what are we talking about there? What, what's the apostles' teaching? that Christ died for us. Okay. So
So, you know, what the apostles taught at the very beginning, the apostles were there doing it, and then they wrote it down. Uh, so, I mean, we're talking about the teaching of God's word, right? So, um, so you got the Bible. To the fellowship, what's fellowship? Gathering and talking about the teachings and yeah. that gathering together around God's word, right? And so the the the, the people seeing one another and talking to one, encouraging one another um, as they're growing in God's word. Um, the breaking of bread. What are we talking about there? Isn't that the Lord's Supper? Okay, the special meal Jesus had given. He broke bread and gave it to him, saying, "Take and eat, take and drink." Um, so that that sacrament for the strengthening of the faith and prayer. Uh, we still, you know, call that the same thing, right? So, uh, um, so notice these are all things that deal with our relationship with God. Like I said, they did a lot of things. They they helped the poor. They they uh, um, helped the widows. All of that. But this is what they're devoted to. Um, so a Christian congregation, a group of people devoted to those things that really matter, a group of people devoted to unity. Let's read 1 Corinthians 1 10. Chip, you want to read that one? I'm not able to read. I'm still on my way home. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Uh Haley, you want that one? Sure. I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that there may be be no divisions among you, and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. Okay. Is, is Paul just uh, dreaming big here? You know, perfectly united in mind and thought. I mean, if, if we even just, you know, on the Zoom call had to decide what the best college football team is, uh, I think it might take us a while, right, to get to perfect unity. Um, blue. Blue. <laughs> I don't know. Go dogs. See, see, look at this. <laughs> yep. No one named an undefeated team even. So I mean, we, we could talk for a while on that. Um, but uh, <laughs> but I mean, this this idea of, of perfectly united that's that's a hard thing to come by. Um, you know what the what's the the best color to paint this room? We could argue. We can all have our opinions. But when he's talking about unity. It's about more than than just the externals. Um, you know, if if we all have to come to consensus or a compromise on something, we're never going to get there. But if we've got something that we can all agree to, well, then we can be perfectly united. Uh, and he wants his word to be that. That's the the next one. A group of people devoted to his word. If if we all say, you know what, we're we're going to come to agreement on what God says, well, then we can have unity. If we're just going to agree to disagree, we're never going to have unity, right? So let's read Hebrews 10, 23. James, you want to play or pass on that one? You're on mute. I don't know if you... All right, we'll, we'll pass you, James. Um, Vicar? Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. Yeah, when God makes a promise, it's true. So we can we can hold unswervingly. We don't have to we don't have to veer from it at all. Um, and there's a note in there. You know, regular attendance at worship and the Bible study are important because they lead us to hold more and more tightly to the truth. If if we're saying, um, oh no worries, um, I just got the the chat there. Uh, you know, if if we're saying that uh, um, we you know, I, I can I can grow in God's word on my own. Yeah, that's good. I can read the Bible. But if we're left on our own, we can find a way to try to make it say whatever we want it to say. When we're with one another, we can uh, we can hold each other accountable and, and, and grow um, in the truth there. Uh, and, you know, gathering together is an encouragement to others and a strengthening for us. Um, you know, when when uh, I stand up in front of church and, and see someone walk in that we haven't seen in a while, that's a huge encouragement to me. Um, or when someone's not there, well, uh, you know, you always wonder what's going on. Are they okay? Uh, so, you know, this, this gathering together, it's, it's, it's an important thing. We need one another. God wired us to need one another. Um, so how about that agree or disagree question there? 
Agree or disagree? If we don't want to be in church every Sunday, we don't have faith. Disagree. Okay. And you want to disagree with Kath or agree? I disagree. Okay. So why? Why are you guys disagreeing with that statement? I mean, just because I don't want to be in church every Sunday doesn't mean I don't have faith. You can have faith and not go to church every Sunday. Yeah, okay. that's not where faith comes from. Okay. So I, believe, is of, oh, go ahead, James. I believe no matter where you're at, any time and every time you're spending time with the Lord and you praise him daily, whether you're at church or not, and that's the whole thing about it. But when you okay. come together as a group, the spirit intensifies this and he hears you a whole lot more because everybody is showing love and kindness and compassion to one another and being there for one another. Okay. And also praising him. Okay. Yeah, great points. Um, you know, the... Uh, uh, wherever we are, we can be worshiping God uh, in his word. But, you know, James talked about that fellowship and, and being with one another and showing that love and being able to, to, to exercise that, that faith is an important thing. Um, and... Now, notice it doesn't say if we're not in church every Sunday. It says we don't want to be. Now, as a believer, God tells us to gather together. So the, the believer in me wants to gather together and hear his word, wants to praise him. But, of course, we, we're not just a believer, right? We have that, we have that faith living in our heart. So we're, we're the, the sanctified, you know, made holy saint. But at the same time, we're also a sinner because we've got that sinful nature in us. And sometimes that sinful nature wins out and says, no, nah, you don't want to be around God's word. You don't want to be around God's people. Um, you know, look at how that one dresses or, or look at how mean that one or, or whatever excuses um, Satan wants to, wants to give us. Uh, so that sinful nature sometimes doesn't want to. That doesn't mean I'm not a Christian. That just means that I'm battling. Um, and, and the more I feed my faith and the stronger that faith becomes, the more I'll, I'll want to uh, be what James was talking about, the, the one to encourage and show love to others and receive that love and, and, and uh, grow together. So, good. Um, any questions, comments on that part? So, the Christian congregation is also a group of people that may include hypocrites. Before we said that uh, um, only God can see who is truly in the church, right? The gathering of all believers, because only he knows who believers are. But he warned that there would be people in the lowercase c church, you know, in the congregation that may be um, trying to fool us. The, the hypocrite, someone who, who claims one thing but truly believes another. Uh, in, in 1 Samuel 16, that's the, the story of when uh, um, God told Samuel to go and anoint the next king of Israel. And he said it's going to be one of, one of Jesse's sons. And, and Samuel got to Jesse's house and he saw the oldest son, Eliab, and he's like, oh, this has got to be the guy, right? He's a head taller than anyone else. He's looking strong. He's a natural leader. Uh, so he's getting ready to anoint him. And God says, that's not the one. Um, because look what he said. He says, man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Uh, he's like, you're looking at the outside. I'm the only one that sees the heart. Um, you know, in John 8, Jesus you know, said, if you hold my teaching, you are really my disciple. So a believer is or a, a a member of the church, a believer, is not just someone who says, yeah, abiding grace is my church, or yeah, I go here, uh, but someone who actually believes what God's word says. Now, hopefully everybody that says, I believe what that is, actually does, but Jesus did warn that Satan would try to, to, to you know, confuse people and, and cause problems by, by bringing in hypocrites. Uh, Vicar, you want to read Matthew 13, the parable Jesus tells? Yeah. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. While everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where, where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. 
The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling up the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. This is one of those times where I'm kind of glad the disciples didn't always get it. Um, because later on, it says that they were in the house and they came up to Jesus and said, hey, Jesus, what were you talking about with that whole story about the weeds and the wheat? And he explained and he said what everything is. And he, he talked about how the the field is the world and the, 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 the wheat are the believers and the weeds are the unbelievers and, and the enemy is the devil and, and the, um, the, the, the seed is, is the word and the, the, um, uh, the, the harvesters are the angels. Um, and, and he talked, you know, so notice what he's saying that there's going to be weeds and wheat right next to each other. And we're going to be tempted to say, oh, let's get rid of that. You know, those look like weeds. Uh, and he says, no, that's not our job. Leave that for the harvesters at the end. Um, I'm told that the, the weeds that grow up in a wheat field look just like the wheat until at the end, they just don't get the head of grain. Um, and so if, if you're trying to find where the, the weeds are or the, you know, you know, you don't belong here, you don't belong here. If we think that's our job, he says, we're going to do damage to the wheat, to the believers. So he says, we just get used to it, right? There's going to be, um, Satan's going to be working. He's going to be trying to cause trouble. That, that doesn't mean that we should say, oh, forget about it, but we should say, oh, God was right. Um, and, and, and let's, let's do what he has us do. I don't know how many times I've, I've heard people say, oh, I don't really want to do the church thing because there's too many hypocrites there. Um, and I always say, well, we could use one more. Um, right? I mean, we, because ultimately every one of us who sins, which is every one of us, in some way is a hypocrite, right? We say we believe in God and we want to do what he wants, and yet then we do something that we shouldn't. Um, that doesn't mean let's give up. Uh, but instead, let's, let's, gather and encourage and grow so that so that more and more we're able to do what um, we say we are and, and and what God has made us um, does that make sense any questions there so we talked about the the holy Christian church which is all believers and only God sees the heart and then the Christian congregation which is all those who gather and and you can see and they all confess the same faith but um, there may be hypocrites in there and it's not our job to weed them out, but uh, um, but we just keep growing in God's word. So we're talking about congregations. The next question then is, how do I choose a congregation? And it looks like I'm frozen. Can you guys still hear me? Yep. Okay, good. Oh, there we go. My video's back. All right. So, um, you know, there are a lot of churches out there, uh, you know, just between... Where, where you live and, and this church, um, you pass by quite a few. Um, yeah, Kat, if you would come here, you'd pass by thousands, right? Um, and so, well, what's the right one? Which one should I go to? Uh, you know, when when uh, we go out and knock on doors and, and I always tell people, I'm looking for people who are looking for a church and I ask them, you know, what, what kind of church are you looking for? I've heard every last answer. Um, you know, when we were in the middle school cafeteria, people, well, I, I want someone who's got a church building, right? Or, or uh, uh, we want a, a one with really good music. And everybody has different definitions of what really good music is. For some, it's, you know, the praise band. For others, it's a pipe organ. And, and you know, there's everything in between on that. Um, others are, well, we want a church that, that uh, helps the poor. Or we want a church that has great children's programs. Or we want a church that uh, you know, has a nice pastor, or we want a church that, you know, whatever. Um, those are all interesting. But when God talks about what we should be looking for in a church, it's none of those things. Um, he wants us to join a congregation that teaches the entire truth. Uh, in John 8, I just read that one before. If you hold my teaching, you are really my disciples. He, he wants someone that, that's going to hold to his teaching. Uh, let's read Matthew 28, 20. I think it's Kat's term. Uh, in teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Yeah, that's Jesus and the Great Commission. He had told them to go and make disciples, baptizing them, and then this. Notice, and he says, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Not teaching them the basics and forgetting about the rest. Not teaching them what kind of makes sense to you. 
But no, everything I have commanded you. Um, in Revelation 22, uh, Jesus at the end of the Bible uh, has some pretty stern words for how serious we're supposed to take his word. Haley, you want that one? Sure. I warn everyone who hears the word of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes words away from this book of prophecy, God will take away from him his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. Yikes. Huh? Um, the plagues that are described in the Bible, there are some gruesome plagues. Uh, he says if we're going to add to scripture, that's what's coming. Or, or if we're going to take away our, our name taken out of the, the uh, book of life, you know, our share in the tree of life. Um, He's serious about it. Nowhere does Jesus say, well, if you believe in Christ, then forget about the rest. It's always, it all goes together. Because any false teaching is really taking away from the truth about Christ. Uh, and so he says, I want you to find some place where the whole truth is being taught. And, and here's the thing, you know, you drive down the, the street, you don't see it up on the, on the sign where they say, hey, false teaching here. Um, no one's going to say that. So it, it, we have to, uh, our job is to evaluate what we're hearing um, and, and maybe do a class like this where they explain this is what we believe. Um, and hopefully they can go back and say, well, it's because what the Bible says. But sadly, too many churches, they don't. Um, it, it's just, well, this makes sense and this, this is good news about God. Um, but Jesus wants us to find the entire truth. And he warns us to watch out for false prophets. Uh, Victor Matthew 7. Watch out, false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. Okay. Wolves in sheep's clothing. You probably heard that before. I just realized my volume wasn't off on this. So, um, sorry. So, wolves in sheep's clothing. Someone unpack that for me. What, what's, the, what's that picture doing? What's that saying? Well, basically, on the outward appearance, they appear to be like something very good, and they are preaching the word, but not really preaching it the way God wants it done and according to his word. And okay. so on the inside, they're just, they're like, they're coming after you. It's like the devil just coming and telling you, you know, they're going to say whatever they can to get you to believe them. And then that's when the devil attacks. Yeah, it's like someone with they act like they have good intentions, but deep down they have malicious intent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the danger of a wolf, right? I mean, uh, even you know, he says this is the false prophets looking innocent, um, but if they're not bringing you the truth, whether they realize it or not, that's dangerous. Um, and God tells us to separate from groups that don't teach the entire truth. So don't encourage it by being a part of it. Um, Romans 16, 17, uh, did Kat just read? So Haley, your turn. I urge you brothers to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. Okay. In Romans 16, it's a whole chapter of Paul uh, talking about how, what a beautiful thing to have fellowship with one another and working together and agreeing in the truth. And he's greeting all sorts of people. But then right in the middle, he says this, watch out um, for those who are causing division because they're, they're, they're putting obstacles contrary to the teachings you've learned. Keep away. Um, because God warns that false teaching grows. Vicar, you want uh, Galatians 5, 9? A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. Yeah, he, he calls false doctrine a little yeast. Um, if you've ever baked bread, uh, you know, you hardly put any yeast in there, and yet somehow it makes the whole bread, it works through and makes the whole thing rise. Uh, in another passage, it talks about, uh, in 2 Timothy, it talks about false teaching as gangrene. Um, my grandma had some gangrene uh, on her foot. Um, and they didn't say, oh, let's watch it. Let's see what happens. They cut off her leg. Was, was that because they hated her? No, it's because if they didn't, that, that gangrene would have spread and grown, gotten to a heart and killed her. Um, and so in order to, you know, Paul uses that picture. Paul teaches like gangrene. You can't, you can't allow it because 
because it grows, it spreads. I mean, you think about this. This isn't this isn't a specific teaching, but think about the way sin grows. Um, back in the '40s or '50s or whatever it was, um, the the Brady Bunch. Like no, before that it was it was uh, I forget the name of the show that first showed a bedroom um, of a married couple, and then there were separate beds, but still the camera went through the bedroom and the people weren't in it. Um, you know, no one was sleeping or anything, but the the networks got hate mail for how how uh, uh, filthy th these things that they're showing. That's a private bedroom. You know, that shouldn't be shown on TV. And then Brady Bunch. When when uh, the married couple was talking in their bed again, the hate mail. How dare you do that? Now think about what's on. Um, you know, it's not married couples. It's not you know. They show stuff that that is just sin, right? Um, how did we get here? Well, it wasn't right away, but it was little by little. They started to accept this, and then that, and then that, and then that, and now. Um, we're at this point, and, and that's what happens with false teaching. It starts with something very small, uh, but it but it grows, you know. So if this isn't true, well then I don't have to believe that, and then I don't believe that, and ultimately, um, you know that that yeah that influence that influence spreads. Um, so yeah, danger of false teaching. So now, as we talk about that question, how do I choose a congregation? Looking at the passages, what God says about what congregation I want to be a part of. Um, I've got a couple questions for you. Agree or disagree? In choosing a congregation, a warm feeling of love shows that the Spirit is with them and that they have the truth. False. Okay, we got one false. Anyone else want to chime in? I say disagree, but I have, I don't know if it's, I don't think love is what I feel, but I do. And one of the reasons why I go to church is because I just feel really content and just at peace when I'm at church. I feel like I have no worry about my day to day when I'm not any when I'm everywhere else. But um, I know that that doesn't mean that it doesn't mean this. OK, yeah. You know, the the that good feeling is awesome. Right. And if we're gathering and hearing about what Jesus has done for us and the love of God and we're showing that to one another, yeah, we're going to have a good feeling, and there's going to be a warm feeling of love. Um, the reality is, is that we are a bunch of sinners, and may maybe one of us is having a really bad day and doesn't act all that loving, right? Or, or maybe, uh, you know, whatever is going on, um, the, the love comes from the truth, not the other way around. Because you could go to a place, and they might seem real friendly, um, but it's wolves and sheep's clothing, right? Um so yeah, so it's it's the truth we're looking for, and the love is a beautiful byproduct, um, but but not the other way around. How about the next one? Agree or disagree? One or two discrepancies of teaching here or there are tolerable as long as Christ crucified is preached. No. Okay. Why are you saying no on that one? I mean, we still believe in Jesus. You know, this group teaches this, and this group teaches that. Um, what's the big deal? Because it was written down in the Bible on what he did, how he lived, what he preached, and there's no discrepancy from what he did. What he said is what he said. Yeah. Yeah, well said. You know, I, I talk to people pretty regularly who will tell me, well, yeah, I go to this church. Whatever, whatever church they're talking about, you know. So let's say, yeah, you know, I go to that Catholic church. My whole family's Catholic. I don't really believe everything that the Catholic Church teaches, but but I still go there, um, just because it's what my my whole family is doing. And then I look at a passage like like these ones that we've looked at and say, well, if it's not if it's not teaching the whole truth, if there's something that's disagreeing with God's word, that's not okay, right? It, it's not well, but you know, my family's there. Well, sometimes. You know, Jesus talked about how, how uh, um, you know, he he brought a uh, a sword that sometimes divides parents and children or or, or brothers and sisters or or whatever, um, because the truth is that important. Uh, so yeah, good. Any questions on that page? 
The last page then is just some notes on church fellowship. You know, we talk about uh, fellowship, you know, gathering together, working together, um, worshiping together. Uh, number one, most church bodies today seek unity on the basis of minimizing differences. God teaches us to seek unity on the basis of adherence to the entire word of God. Um, you know, I, I'm convinced that Satan would love it if all the churches joined together. Um, and we would say, yeah, that'd be great. We could do so much more and there wouldn't be the competition. But um, that would be great if we're joining together with the truth. But if, if you're joining together and this group has this false teaching and that group has that false teaching and, and they come together, um, what happens? The false teaching spreads into both. Uh, instead of instead of you know if you if you're saying hey we'll agree to disagree, um, you're not agreeing on the truth and and you're not going to be able to grow in the truth and eventually you're not going to be able to say anything uh, without debate. Um, number two though, there's a difference between a Christian church that teaches falsely and a non-Christian church. Wherever God's word is, God works. Um, and if if someone believes in Jesus as their savior, even though their church might teach something contradictory, like, like you got to do enough good works to earn heaven. Um, but if someone is trusting in Jesus as their savior, you know, God's word works and, and, and not everybody that's a part of a certain church believes uh, exactly what that church teaches. Um, and, and so, uh, again, whoever believes in Jesus will be in heaven whether they're Baptist or Lutheran or Catholic or Methodist or, or whatever, even though there are different teachings in some of those churches, um, if they're trusting in Jesus, they'll be in heaven. Now, if they take a false teaching to its logical conclusion, and any false teaching ultimately results in us trusting in ourselves instead of in Christ, um, if they take the logical conclusion, uh, well, they're, they're getting pulled away from Christ. So there's a danger there. But when we talk about the different teachings of different churches, we're not saying that, you know, we're the only ones that are going to be in heaven. Whoever trusts in Jesus is going to be in heaven. Um, and number three, God's word is clear. The reason different church bodies come to different conclusions is because the devil is constantly trying to steer people away from the truth because the world sometimes doesn't like to hear the truth and because our own sinful flesh is hostile to God. Um, you know, Satan's always trying to, to uh, cause problems. Number four, in practicing church fellowship, we're not judging people's faith. Only God can do that. Instead, we judge teachings, and God's instructed us to do that. Um, so, you know, if, if uh, well, I'll give you an example. When when uh, we were starting the church 20 years ago now, uh, I was friends with a pastor of another church in town, and uh, he invited me to preach at their joint uh, Thanksgiving service. He said there was going to be a Baptist preacher, there was going to be, a, um, he was a Methodist, um, and there was going to be one other, and then he asked if I if I join in, and we do this big group service, and you know, he said it'll be great, you know, people will, will hear about you guys, and, and uh, um, but I said, I, I don't think I can do that, because, you know, that would be, that would give me, be giving the impression that we all teach the same thing, um, and, you know, we knew that Methodists and Lutherans, we don't teach the same thing, right? There were differences of, of what we believed. Now, you know, we were confident that we both believed in Jesus, but, uh, but uh, um, you know, if I love God's word enough, I'm not going to compromise it by saying, yeah, it's okay to teach something that's against God's word. Um, and if I, if I love my people enough, I'm not going to tell them, it doesn't really matter what, you know, what teachings you follow. Um, and yeah, if we really, it's a, a love for God's word, a love for our own souls, and love for the souls of others, uh, to, and, and to be practiced in humility. You know, if I would have come in there and said, "No, you're wrong. I'm right. Uh, I'm not joining with you," that would have that wouldn't have been right either, right? Uh, but uh, a realization that we want unity, but we got to base, we got let's come to an agreement on what Scripture says first before calling unity where there isn't. Um, and number six, the truths become more and more appealing as we grow in our understanding of God's love for us and for all, and as we grow in our understanding of his word. Um, love for God's word makes it impossible to compromise God's word. Any questions on any of that? I have one. Um, yeah. It goes back to Revelations 22. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't read every version of the Bible, so it makes me wonder with all the different versions. I mean, is that a should I be keeping my eye out for a certain version or? Great question. So when you say version, we're talking about different translations, right? Um, you know, the, translation is a is a, a huge topic, um, and I'm kind of nerdy on it, so I could talk for way too long. So I'll try to keep it. I'll try to keep it short. You know, when when the uh, uh, NIV re up redid their their translation in 2011, uh, I got to be on the committee that evaluated like 10 different Bible translations for, you know, which one our church body would would use in publications and, and in worship and stuff like that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, like I said, I could talk for a long time. So the, the basic goal of a translation, because the Bible was written in Hebrew and Greek. If I just stood up on Sunday and read Hebrew and Greek, you know, you come in and you hear me saying, there's more love on I, on I, uh, or or uh, um, let's see, um, I'm trying to think of a. a You've uh, already uh, lost me. I don't right. get it. Yeah. <laughs> I, there's not communication going on. Um, it, already on Pentecost, God gave the disciples the ability to translate, right? And so they were able to speak in these other languages. God still gifts his church with, with people uh, who, who can speak different languages and communicate the word of God. So these translations are a huge thing. I mean, Jesus used a Greek translation of the Old Testament and quoted it sometimes, because the Old Testament was Hebrew, New Testament was Greek. Um, so these translations are a great thing. Now, a translation, the goal is to get the thoughts of the original into the thoughts of the receptor language or whatever we're speaking, right? Um, because languages don't have word-for-word matchups, right? I mean, you think about, uh, if I say the word key, um, in Spanish, there's a different word for uh, the thing that you put in your car to start it, or the part on the basketball court where, um, you know, you, you take the ball out in a game of one-on-one, or the uh, the answer list for a test, right? Um, there's not one-to-one uh, things, you know, the the, I'm told the Eskimo language has like 26 different words for snow that we would all translate with the word snow. Um, so, I mean, it's not a one for one thing. So the goal is to get the idea into the idea of the, the receptor language, and that's going to happen in different ways. Some of the translations of the Bible are written for a, a third grade reading level, some for an eighth grade reading level, some for a high school reading level. Um, and so they're going to use different words. And, you know, King James and its tradition goes back to a, a 500 year old translation that, uh, you know, if you read the original Shakespeare stuff or like Chaucer, um, it doesn't make any sense at all because we don't, those words don't even mean the same thing uh, anymore. And even, even in my lifetime, I've seen words change meaning. You know, gay uh, certainly changed meaning through the, the course of it, or, you know, some, some of these other words um, or drip, right? You know, 20 years ago, Drip was was what the water that's that's coming down. Now it's how thicker looks, right? Um, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, but words change. So so uh, translations are constantly uh, advancing and, and updating. Uh, all that to say, there are a ton of great English translations. If you've got one that you can understand, great. You know, I grew up, my first few years were using the King James Version. And so a lot of the stuff I memorized as a kid, um, you know, and, and but you had to be, it had to be explained, what does it mean? Because we don't say thee and thou and henceforth and where, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, but if, if King James is, is the language that, that you've been taught in, great, use King James or one of its uh, updates. Um, if if uh, we in church, we use NIV 2011. Just so that there's some consistency, uh, you know, the, in the bulletins and things like that. But like in Bible study, I'll encourage people bring your own, you know, bring what translation you like. And so around the table, we'll have one guy reading from the EHV and one from the ESV and one from the the NASB and and someone from the King James and and all of that. Um, a lot of great translations. All the pastors in our synod have to learn Hebrew and Greek. 
so that we can compare those. And if you've got questions and you're like, how come, how can King James says this and this one says that? Ask. Like I said, I'm a nerdy about that. I love that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, but um, I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, as long as you're not using the uh, the Jehovah's Witness one that isn't really a translation, but they uh, um, but they just changed it to say things they wanted it to say. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, you got uh, uh, a lot of great options out there. If you're looking for some suggestions, just let me know. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And I'm sorry, way too much information for a short little question, but a great question. Um, any other questions there? I put some other passages about church fellowship there. If you want to do some more study, you can you can look those up. Um, talking about the danger of false teaching and and, and how important uh, unity and, and the, the complete agreement are. Um, so that's that's chapter five. Um, and my plan was then to pick up in eight where you guys left off. Uh, Kat did tell me that she had a couple of questions from what you guys talked about last time. So maybe we'll start with that. So we'll turn to chapter eight, page 44. Um, and Kat, you got to remind me, what were your questions? Okay. Um, what does God say about capital punishment? Okay. So, you know, you've got the uh, um, the fifth commandment, you shall not murder, right? Um, King James, you know, you shall not kill. Uh, murder is unjust killing. Back in the, the 17th century, um, the word kill referred to any and all, you know, so, so again, the word has slightly changed its meaning, but, um, but God tells us not to take a life where we're not supposed to. The same God who says, do not murder, told um, the people to the people of Israel to kill everyone in Jericho because they uh, they worshiped false gods and they were going to be a danger for the people of Israel and they had been re rebelling against God and it was time for them to be done. So, so God told the people of Israel to kill them. Was that murder? No. Um, life is, is God's to give and God's to take. That's the principle we're talking about here. God tells us it is a sin to take a life when that is not our right, when, when God hasn't given us that privilege. Now, um, God has given to the government, I think you read last time, the, the passage about the government being uh, God's servant to do you good, um, and it's got the sword. Um, so God has given to the government the, the right to do that when waging war. Uh, you know, So a soldier that, that goes into battle, um, if they are uh, serving their government, the government that God has established, uh, and they're taking a life to protect uh, the people, um, that's not murdering. Uh, that's fulfilling God's command and God's will. Um, likewise, capital punishment. Now, um, we are living in a country where we have the, the opportunity to vote and to make, uh, to have an influence on the laws uh, on what we as a country decide to do. So God has given the governments the right to take a life, um, to protect the people, to punish wrongdoers. But uh, we're not told that we have to. And so now we have, as a, as a society, um, we get to make decisions on to whether that's a good idea or not. You look at the Old Testament people of Israel, and the, the punishment for murder was death. Um, in certain situations. In accidental situations, there is a whole other uh, way to, to go about that. Um, am I answering your question? Any follow-up on that? No. Okay. So capital punishment was one, and then you had another one, I think. Yes. What does God say about abortion in reference to rape, incest, and for the health of the mother? Okay. Um, we got We always got to go back to the principle. What What's the principle? God is the giver of life, and He's the only one who has the right to take it. Right. Um, so we want to respect life as a gift from God. Um, when someone uh, 
makes my life inconvenient, I don't have the right to end their life. When someone is, you know, brings up some bad memories for me, I don't have the right to end their life. Um, you know, so so uh, the question is, is the unborn child a life? Well, you know, you, you look at the, the psalm that talks about, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. If I was a sinner from then, I was a, I was a person from back then. Um, and, and so to end that life is not something that God has given us the, the right to do. I understand, you know, politically, I understand all, all the arguments, and I'm not, I'm not making a political statement uh, one way or the other on what the, the government should do. But what does God say? Um, because again, the government's rules and God's rules don't always line up. Um, and uh, uh, for, you know, like, um, what, what does God call marriage? He calls marriage one man, one woman, lifelong. Um, our government does not. Uh, is that good or bad for society? Um, well, if you know, Moses had the people issue a certificate of divorce, even though he said, God hates divorce, don't do it. Uh, but they were doing it, and so it had to be legislated, it had to be legal, it had to be fair, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, and so does the does that whole discussion of marriage. So, so again, this isn't a political thing. Uh, this is, what does God say? Um, taking a life is sin. Um, what if someone wronged me? Does that mean that I can commit that sin? No. Um, and yeah, I, I, I feel for those who have gone through um, horrible situations like that, but, but one sin does not excuse another or does not make another okay. Uh, for the health of a mother, um, you still want to take that, uh, that perspective of um, let's respect the gift of life. If this mom, by going through the process of, of uh, letting the pregnancy continue, so let's say an ectopic pregnancy, where they say there's no way that the child is going to survive, and if it grows any further, mom's going to die. If I respect life as hard as it is, I may have to do that to save mom's life because I'm respecting God's gift of life. And, and you know, so that, again, it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis, uh, but we always want to go back to the principle, what is, uh, what is God's will? And it is that we respect the gift of life and realize that it is his to give and his to take. Does that uh, answer the question? Yes, it does. Okay, excellent. Any others on that? So yeah, you guys have gotten through five and I guess we'll, we'll start six uh, next time uh, just because uh, it is now eight o'clock. So those, those worked out perfectly. Um, any, any other questions or comments from anyone else? All right, let's close with prayer. Lord God, thank you for this time in your word. And thank you for the church. Uh, help our church be a blessing that we all seek unity around your word, that, that we all um, are able to, to show that love and concern for, for others and, and that desire for your truth. Uh, bless us as we wrestle with the difficult questions of our life and our society that we may um, make wise decisions and, and demonstrate your love in everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.